Dr. Emerson, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it, Noel. You know, I, I can't tell you the personal transformation this book has had for my wife and I. Uh, I know that we've been excited about having you on the show. And I can, tell, I, can, I can say that for thousands of couples, this message has resonated in so many ways. And so excited to just jump right in there. And I'm going to go after the, kind of the, the guts of this. And let's start with what is the crazy cycle? Well, the University of Washington studied 2,000 couples for 20 years. And uh, they said, we now know the two basic ingredients for uh, successful marriages. And they had a laboratory setting. They had couples kind of living together. They would have clinicians there evaluating body language, word choice, uh, and they said it comes down to love and respect, that those marriages that succeeded were carried along with that attitude of love and respect, and when that attitude of love and respect was not there, the marriage began to suffer. And as I say, many of us think if we don't have you know, money problems, if we didn't have sex problems, if we didn't have in-law problems, we would have a great marriage. And we all know that the less stress there is, the better, but the point that they're making is it's really, and I've been making for 15 years, it, when Sarah, my wife, and I get into a heated fellowship, <laughs> we might say, <laughs> and over some maybe money management issues, it's, it's not the money per se that's going to cause us to have a bad marriage. It's my unloving attitude toward her mm -hmm. that deflates her. Or when she has a disrespectful, contemptuous attitude toward me that I deflate. And this is where we end up thinking, you know, if we didn't have the money problems, we'd have a great relationship. No, it's the hostility and contempt that we show to each other during those moments. And, and what's sad is that we're not trying to be unloving or disrespectful, but we appear that way to the other. And we'll point out in this conversation, she has a vulnerability on one side of that equation of love and respect, and he has a vulnerability on the other side. And though we all need love and respect equally, the felt need is as different as night is from day. Mm. You know, and uh, yeah, the, the, the concept of the crazy cycle, I think represents so many couples who struggle with, we fight all the time or we're just not communicating. And, and you've been able to simplify that in terms of this concept of the crazy cycle. And yet I, I, I would love for you to explain a little bit more to our listeners around the topic of love and respect, right? Because I think we use love in a lot of different situations. Like I love my dog and I love my wife and and then, you know, specific to our couples in the military, respect can mean a lot of different things, kind of like stand and salute. Um, so maybe give us, define those two concepts for us. Right. An excellent question. And maybe back up to the crazy cycle itself, because if we all need love and respect equally, uh, that's one thing. But if during conflict, uh, she leans toward, let's say, the love side and he leans toward the, the respect side, uh, then it's going to be an interesting kind of interaction. And what do I mean? If she feels unloved, she tends to negatively react. But mm -hmm. what we discovered is she reacts in ways that feels disrespectful to him. And when he feels disrespected, he ends up reacting in a way that feels unloving to her. And that's the crazy cycle. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he and this baby starts to spin. <laughs> and oh, we've asked 7,000 people this question. When you're in a conflict with your spouse, do you feel unloved at that moment or disrespected? Mm. Get this, 83% of the men, 83% wow. of the men said they feel disrespected. Wow. 72% 70, of the women say they feel unloved. Now, it's always important for me to insert, women need R-E-S-P-E-C-T, <laughs> women need respect, and men need L-O-V-E. I mean, a percentage, obviously, you see it, on the other side of the equation. But generally speaking, if you treat a woman disrespectfully, she'll end up saying, how can you treat me disrespectfully and say that you love me? But when you treat a man disrespectfully, he'll say, I don't deserve this disrespect. Everybody respects me. Mm -hmm. Why does he tend not to land on the love side? Women love to love. It's within their nature to nurture. So during conflict, you ask Joe, hey, Joe, does your wife love you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> does she like you? No, <laughs> not today, <laughs> not today. See, men begin to see that very same conflict through the respect grid, whereas she sees things through the love grid, and particularly as she sets forth whatever it is that's on her heart, she doesn't see herself as disrespectful. Mm -hmm. She may criticize, she may critique, she may be negative, but it's all because she cares, so she confronts because she cares. 
But the research points out that that criticism and critique and, and, and complaint over a period of time is felt to the man as disrespect and contempt. And so the question is, is it care or is it contempt? And the same thing on the other side, men tend to withdraw. 85% the University of Washington found out, withdraw, they stonewall. 85% of those who do that are men. Hmm. And women were asked, when your husband shuts down and says, forget it, drop it, I don't want to talk about it, what do you feel? The woman said, it feels like an act of hostility. I couldn't imagine shutting down over such a minor criticism, the women said. <laughs> but in our world, in our world as a man, we shut down and withdraw because they found that when men are in conflict, their heartbeats get to 99 beats per minute. That's warrior mode. Yeah. And in a heated moment with a spouse, a wife, we feel provoked. And physiologically, we're reacting like there's a, a gun pointed to my head. So what do we do when our best friend is provoking us? We've got to calm down. So we do the honorable thing by saying, drop it, forget it. I don't want to talk about it. I mean, we have to calm down. So the question is, is it an act of hostility or an act of honor? Hmm. Is it an act of care? Or is it an act of contempt? And this is where couples get confused because her heart's in the right place, his heart's in the right place, but it doesn't appear that way to the other person, and that's why the crazy cycle keeps spinning. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I have to wonder, you know, what are some of the ways that women mistakenly um, think that they're being respectful and men mistakenly think that they're being loving? Well, I think uh, maybe a, a, a beginning question is, how do women not realize they're being disrespectful? Right. And how is it that men don't feel, you know, unloving and yet they come across as unloving? Well, for the reason I just stated, first of all, she moves toward him to confront. She confronts to connect. She confronts because she cares. But when you continue to confront a man over a period of time, that begins to feel like disrespect, that mm -hmm. you're just using this topic as another opportunity to send me a message that you don't like who I am as a human being, that you don't accept me, that you find me inadequate. And on that point, Shanti Feldhahn, a good friend, Harvard yeah. you know, graduate. We've had she, her on the show. So, oh, Shanti's fabulous. Well, they, they asked this question through decision analyst out of Houston, a secular group that asked the 400 American males uh, this question, and they ran it again because the findings were so extraordinary. One of the questions was this, would you men rather be left alone and unloved in the world or be viewed as inadequate and disrespected by everyone? Almost 80% Noel, of the men said they'd rather be left alone and unloved in the world. In other words, <laughs> men cannot handle the feeling that you find me inadequate and you don't respect me because of it. And so now here you have this conflict with his wife and she's basically sending this message, I, I feel um, unloved, I feel alone, so that research points out that men are very sensitive to the feeling that you see them as inadequate and you don't respect them, especially when they fail to be as loving as they ought to be and the wife is feeling left alone. Mm -hmm. Now, here's to the point. Women are very innocent and good-spirited and good-willed in trying to convey to their husbands their personal needs. But when they come across to that husband in a way that says, I really don't respect you because of your inadequacies, she's going to lose his heart over a period of time. And so too, though, on the other side, a man has to decode, it's very important, that at the end of the day, is she a good woman? Is she a godly woman, a great woman, a, a woman of virtue? And is she really trying to put me down? Or is she saying, I have a need that only you can meet, and I'm coming toward you aggressively because I feel vulnerable, and I have a need for your love, and you're the only man in my life that can meet that need. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a compliment, not a complaint. And this is where we're helping couples then begin to decode these ideas. And once they do, it, we start grinning at each other when we see that the other's just acting normal. Right. Well, and it's, I think it's so true in the sense of guys withdrawing and shutting down. And when that happens, whether that's uh, physically shown or emotionally, the woman t sends, tends to see that as, oh my gosh, maybe I'm not... Um, I'm not saying enough or I need to turn up the volume. And he says, wow, I'm, I really see that you want to fight, you know? And so he's trying to distance himself and there's this battle that goes on. I, I think a lot of guys can relate to that, um, that sense. But my question, I think to relate it to that is how can we still acknowledge um, appropriate emotions such as anger and frustration while at the same time demonstrating that loving and respectful uh, tone? Uh, yeah, as an excellent question. That's right. People think that if you do the loving 
respectful thing, you have to become robotic. Right. And uh, here would be an illustration. I can't believe what you just did, he says to her. I don't know how to do this love thing. You know my family origin things. I don't know how to say this lovingly, but you just backed into the garage for the fourth time, and it's costing me money. How do we talk about this without you feeling unloved? See, if he uses the vocabulary of love, uh -huh. if he says he's not trying to be unloving, if he, he, you have to bring out on the table the idea that you're not trying to be unloving. And she will accept that anger, that frustration, the hurt, as long as he keeps it within that parameter. So you're not robotic. You can get very upset as long as you let her know that you're not trying to be unloving. So too, a woman says, well, how do you do this respect thing? Just say to him, how do I say this without you thinking I'm trying to use this as just another moment to tell you I don't respect who you are and find that you're inadequate. You're an honorable man, and I'm not trying to dishonor you, but I'm hurting right now. How do I get through to you without you shutting down on me? Hmm. See? As long as you use what I call the respect talk, most men are going to stay engaged because you're letting the person know that there's no secret agenda here. And that's so important because a lot of times we feel that there's really an undercurrent here. The issue really isn't the issue. The real issue is she finds me despicable. The real issue is he doesn't love me. And, and we've got to let the other person know where our heart's really coming from so that they're not inappropriately suspicious. Hmm. Yeah, and... and... <sighs> When you've seen this play out, I mean, I think you do a great job describing this in the book as what you're talking about is from the perspective that both partners or both spouses are operating from a place of goodwill mm -hmm. and that this really breaks down quickly. If they're, if that premise is not in the relationship, could you define what you, when you say goodwill, what do you mean by that? Well, I always ask people, you know, if it's, it's like this, you know, I, I talk about goodwill and this woman wrote me and said, well, I married Satan. I said, really? She said, yes. And I said, well, where is Satan right now? Well, he's down at the park with our kids. <laughs> I, said, I said, lady, you're overstating the case. No mother's going to give her children to Satan. So one of the things we have to do is temper these comments we make. There is this tendency to escalate uh, things to such a way that we're impugning the other person's motive. We're, we're, we're saying to them that they're ill-willed. They're even e evil willed. And, and, and maybe you did marry Hitler's distant cousin. You know, I mean, I can't know every situation. But one of the things that I, gar I challenge people with is don't attack the person's motive. The only way you're going to know their motive is if they tell you their motive. OK, what we have to do is address the issues and whatever that is, address it and keep it there. Once we escalate it to the fact that you have impure motives, you don't care. You're not a respectful person. Once we start attacking that inner heart, uh, we're going to lose them. What is a better posture to say, look, in the overall scheme of things, this person has basic goodwill. My husband is not trying to get up early in the morning and storyboarding ways to be unloving toward me. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm going to feel unloved. Now, the question is, did he intend to be unloving or not? And so, too, my wife, did she get up even before me and storyboarded ways to be disrespectful for me, to diss me, that her mission in life is to put me down? Or is she basically a woman of goodwill and as not her intent? And that's why we talk about decoding. We have to decode. On that crazy cycle, without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love. The question each of us has to ask is this. Is my wife reacting to me because she's needing reassurance of my love? Or she's reacting to me because her motive is to be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. And so, too, without respect, you know, the husband reacts in ways that feel unloving. You know, is he, in fact, trying to be unloving? Or did I say or do something that felt disrespectful? And is she? And so we have to come to that point where we say, you know what? She's not trying to be disrespectful. She's probably feeling unloved. He's not trying to be unloving. He's probably feeling disrespected. And I'm going to give this person the benefit of the doubt. Now, that's a decision that we have to make. Now, that does not minimize the fact that there are betrayals, there's adultery, there's some really wicked stuff. So how do we make sense out of that? Well, two thoughts. There are moral indiscretions, but there are also this ongoing clashing preferences that are not immoral. Mm -hmm. We're just fighting all the time over the color of the carpet. I like that. Okay. The That's clashing that. preference issues, you know, let's not escalate that then to evil will. We right. just differ with each other. Yeah. But now what about adultery? And they say, well, Emerson, how can I believe there's goodwill when they betrayed me? Well, they don't have goodwill. There is a Judas experience. So now either the relationship is going to end because of that, or can we go back? Because when I married Sarah, 
many years ago, I didn't say, you know, I hate you, Sarah, and you hate me, so let's get married. <laughs> it doesn't go down that way. So couples have all this goodwill, 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 but then there's this derailing, and then comes the adultery. Yeah. It's the derailing where they got on the crazy cycle and they weren't decoding correctly. Now, if a couple is willing, even though this evil has happened, to say, you know what, I wasn't trying to be unloving toward you. I realize now that you felt that way. Well, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful, but I realize you're trying. Healing comes almost instantaneously. Yeah. Uh, there was one group that spent $50,000 surveying our results of our seven-hour conference. And in that, the sample was not great, but there were people that either were divorced that came together. So they're divorced, but they showed up. Why? I don't know. Or they were in the process of divorcing and they showed up. Mm. No, 60% of them called off the divorce after the conference. Wow. We were blown away by that. Why? Because if I can get couples to realize they got derailed when neither one were evil intent, mm -hmm. there was no evil intent. There was just an honest misunderstanding, but then they became vulnerable to somebody out there who met the need for love or honor and respect. And if they're willing to say, you know what, I'll own up to my 50% here. Please forgive me. Can we think about reconciliation? Can we run at this again? I had no idea what I was contributing. Rather than just pointing the finger, you're at fault, you're to blame, which they could possibly do. They say, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And if they're willing to do that, healing comes even in the worst of scenarios. And we've seen it again and again and again. Mm. That That's amazing. I mean, truly phenomenal Uh research on your end. I, I want to back up a little bit because, you know, you talk about goodwill and, and coming at it from that perspective, but I have to think that there are some listeners, particularly wives who are asking the question right now. Yeah. So maybe I didn't marry, you know, uh, Hitler's distant cousin, but I really don't think my husband deserves my respect because of years of the way he's treated me or things that he said, um, or actions that have been taken in our, in our relationship. How do you address that in, in, as it relates to this whole crazy cycle and showing respect? Right. The, 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 we talk about the fact that love is unconditional and everybody buys into that. So that a man ought to be loving whether she's lovable or not, right? Mm. I mean, yeah. can you say, I'm not going to love her because she's not lovable? Every female on the planet would be up in protest about that. But when we talk about unconditional respect then that's an oxymoron, it's a contradiction, and people are, what are we talking about there? So the conclusion is respect must be earned. The whole idea is that a person must deserve it. And that's where the culture's at, and that sentiment is a, a common sentiment. So yeah. I don't fault the person for feeling that way. But then I always say to them, okay, let's take it to the next step then. So he doesn't deserve your respect, he's not earned the respect. So now what? You're gonna show him disrespect and contempt? No husband. <laughs> No human being feels fond feelings of love and affection in his heart toward a person who despises who he is as a human being. So now we're at a crossroads. So now the question is this, are we asking you to show respect to him because he deserves it, or are we showing you to be a respectful individual in your demeanor as you confront him on those things that are not loving or respectable? Mm -hmm. It's a matter of you being a woman of dignity that carries yourself in a respectful demeanor as you deliver the impact of the truth that you need to relay to him. If you communicate your upset in a contemptuous way, he will not hear your heart any more than a woman will hear the hostility, you know, the, 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 from a man who's hostile and unloving toward her while he's trying to convey what it is that he's trying to hear her, mm -hmm. uh, wanting her to hear. You cannot deliver a message to a woman in a hostile, unloving way. It will not work, and everybody buys into that. I am strongly saying you cannot deliver a truthful message to a male in a contemptuous, disrespectful way. He may deserve the disrespect, but you're not going to help him one iota. It won't work. So it's incumbent upon the woman to figure out we're not talking about the fact that he needs to be a certain type of person before I'm going to respect him. The challenge is for you to be a respectful person while confronting him. Why? In these conflicts, it this is what the research points out, what we found. When we get on that crazy cycle, when a woman is feeling unloved, it's within her nature to be disrespectful. It's within her nature to be loving, but it's within her nature to be disrespectful when she feels unloved. Now, that's not a motive, but her eyes darken, the face turns sour, hand on the hip, scolding finger, the sigh, the rolling the eyes, the head goes back, and the word choice of contempt is incredible. The research has pointed this out. These are all gestures of contempt. 
Now, every woman knows she's trying to get a message through, so he'll say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And she'll soften, and she will just love on it. Hmm. But it doesn't get to that point because she's delivering the message in a way that's offensive to him. In the same way that an angry male isn't going to get through to the female, even if she said, I'm sorry for being disrespectful, he would immediately soften. But what happens, it doesn't go down that way. So part of the challenge for every woman is he listens to me. It is not about who he's failing to be. It's about who you must be in order to get through to him who he's failing to be. Wow. Yeah. And I, I, one of the, one of the things that when you describe this and kind of the uh, mechanics that are happening underneath it, uh, what fear comes to the surface for men and women when you start introducing the concept of the love and, and respect cycle? Yes. Well, if I do this, my spouse may not respond. And so this is why we come across in that uh, unloving way at times. Men know that they're going to stiffen. They're not going to soften. They're not going to say, I'm sorry, we forgive me, not stay connected, not stay engaged. They want to exit because they feel too vulnerable. And they feel like if I stay engaged, she's just going to stay at me. Okay. Or I'm going to make some confession here and she's just going to use it against me. So it's safer for me to withdraw and remain silent. It's just safer and I feel better, and I don't have an emotional need to connect, and so it just feels more secure and safe. And so, too, when a woman is upset, it's, there's something within every woman that moves toward the man she loves, and she is not going to let him walk off. She's going to chase him into the next room. She's going to follow him. She's threatened at the core of her being. And there's a fear that if I were to go quiet, or if I was to say, you know, I was disrespectful, that he's not going to own up to his issues. So fear and, uh, you know, insecurity is what drives this because all of us um, have inadequacies and mm -hmm. we are very vulnerable, uh, particularly if we say, you know, you're coming across unlovingly or you're coming across disrespectfully and the other person says, well, you don't deserve love or respect or who would want to love or respect you. So we find safety in our negative reactions. See, without love, defensively, she reacts, you know, without respect. You know, and without respect, defensively, he reacts without love. But here's what happens. Without love, defensively, she reacts offensively without respect. Mm -hmm. And without respect, defensively, he reacts offensively without love. So even though we all know, well, they should decode that I'm being defensive. They should know that I'm feeling insecure here. They should know. They should know. They should know. <laughs> but when we react, we end up offending them by the choices that we make. And so it keeps feeding that crazy cycle. Wow. Yeah. So how would a couple, I mean, when, when they're feeling unloved or disrespected, what's the best way for them to respond? Well, I think that first thing is to say to myself, you know, is, is she really trying to be disrespectful here? Is this really her motive? Mm -hmm. Or is she a woman of goodwill who's reacting in a way that's stepping on my air hose? You know, I need respect like I need air to breathe and I got a respect tank over here and she's stepping on my air hose. But is she intending to step on my air hose? Or is she really just crying out from a point of vulnerability and that she has a need for my strength? Mm -hmm. Once we frame it that way with Sarah, my wife, you know, once I realize she's reacting negative, she's coming across disrespectfully, but it's all rooted in the fact that she needs me. She needs something from me. She needs my strength. And I say to women, you need to say that. Don't feel like you're forsaking the feminist team by saying, I need your strength right now. Mm -hmm. it's, he's not going to, it's just, he's going to soften. He's going to melt on that kind of comment. Because he's hearing you're inadequate and I don't respect you, but now you say, I need your strength. I need reassurance. I need something from you that only you can give me. That message softens him. And so to the, husband, the wife on the other side, it, when he shuts down like that and walks away, is he really trying to be unloving or is he trying to do the honorable thing? And what the, 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 the alternative here is to say, hey, I know you're an honorable man trying to calm down. I think I probably reacted too much here. Can we talk in 15 minutes after you, things calm down? And I only want to talk for 15 minutes. Huh. Don't, don't, don't be unending there. You won't come back if he thinks it's going to go on for two more hours. <laughs> but I talk about frequency versus duration. Sarah and I came to a point where we had 15 minutes every day where I would just sit with her and let her share my heart, you know, 15 minutes every day. And that predictability kept her from these moments where she had to dump on me because she wasn't able to access me. And so in the early stages with a woman, though, who may not have that regular 15 minutes, you need to reassure him that you're not going to keep talking at him for two hours until you feel better. It's, it, just because you feel better doesn't mean that he does. So if he's walking away, say, I know you need to calm down. Hey, 
can we revisit this in 15 minutes for only 15 minutes? And stay on the main point. Don't bring in a whole lot of other points. Let him know, and you say, well, he should be strong enough to come back. No, he would die for you, but he lives in fear of that contemptuous tongue. This is a man of incredible strength who would die for you, literally. But he's extremely vulnerable to dishonor, disrespect, and contempt. And if he fears that getting back into that conversation, he's going to hear the message, I don't respect you because you're inadequate, he'll avoid you. So what you have to do to say to him, hey, you're a man of honor, I know you're calming down, I, and I need to calm down, I want to talk about this for 15 minutes, and then we'll end it even if we don't get it resolved today, and I want to be able to say this in a way that honors you, but I have a need. Hey, I don't know of too many guys, Noel, that will avoid that. Mm -hmm. This is where we are strong in saying, you've got to be very cautious in saying this man lacks goodwill. You know, it's like, I, sometimes we'll have 3,000 people at our conferences, and, 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 you know, the women say, well, I don't know if my husband's got goodwill. Well, is he here? Well, yeah. Men of ill will and evil will don't show up to a marriage conference. Now, is he reacting to you in ways that you can't imagine reacting? And if you reacted the way he did, it would mean you don't value the other person, like stonewalling and walking away. Mm -hmm. That is the epitome that I don't care in a woman's world. But that's not the case in a man's world. And this is where we've got to revisit the idea that because we're equal as man and woman does not mean that we're the same. He will always bring the sperm. She will always bring the egg, and it's never going to be any other way. <laughs> so when, when you say that, and I love the approach that to help soften that, could it be as simple as just one of them saying, ouch, that really made me hurt? And what you just said hurt, um, is that, I, I'm just thinking of some practical ways, because if this thing has been spinning for some time, the crazy cycle, generally that response is reactive and it sends us going back through the whole crazy cycle again. What are some real practical ways that in the moment they can respond when they feel disrespected or, you know? Yeah, well, if they've gotten into this conflict, then if you say, you know, that really hurt, that could work, but they might say, well, I don't care right now if it hurts. I'm glad mm -hmm. that it hurts. You know, mm -hmm. what you just said to me, it's tit for tat. But <laughs> I think there needs to be a little humor. Uh, and one of the things that we say, if, if she has this love tank connected by an air hose, he has this respect tank, if they can introduce at some point that metaphor, that visual, then during these heated moments, you can say, you're stepping on my air hose right now. And, and that, a lot of couples have told us, no, that, that really works, you know, or I'm choking, I can't breathe, you know. You're yeah. So you know, we got to stay a little light in the midst of these heavy moments. Yep. We've got to have that twinkle in the eye just a little bit because it will soften a great deal. It's not easy to do when we're spitting mad, but this is why the University of Washington studied couples and came out strong. We have this idea that volatility is a, a major problem in marriages and that people who are calm really have the better marriages. No way. They didn't find that out. Volatility doesn't mean violence here. It means kind of that Italian, you know, and what they would see is these the husband and wife Italians, for instance, just using that ethnic group just because it's fun. They, they would be, yeah, I can't believe what you said to me, woman. You, I can't, well, you, you, you don't have a brain in your head. She says, they're going on. And then in the midst of this, he says, oh, you're so sexy. I could make passionate love with you right now, but I'm so spitting mad at you. <laughs> see, see what he did? Yeah. And they found out that the, the volatility, they were being humorous. They were saying things. They were making huge deposits while they were making withdrawals. Whereas the people who avoid conflict weren't making any withdrawals, but weren't making any deposits. So one of the ways you make a deposit while you're mad at each other is inserting humor, not at their expense, but just these metaphors. You're stepping on my air hose. I'm choking. Or, you know, we talk about she sees things through the pink sunglasses. He sees it through the blue sunglasses. And say, here. Put on my pink sunglasses. You don't see what I see right now. Well, you put on my blue sunglasses. Yeah. And just enough to take that tension off. And we've coached couples on doing this, and many couples have said they've introduced this. And, uh, and here's the deal. When you first do some of these things, the other person may say, I know what you're doing, and I'm not going to respond. Don't now take offense at that. This is where some people, they're taking up offense after offense after offense after offense. And sometimes just do these things over a period of time, you'll see some reciprocity. It's just something that will work. But you've, you've got to be mature enough here to not resort to these adolescent reactions. And, and I will say that we all are adolescents. I spoke to five NF health head football coaches and their spouses, and you would know every one of these coaches, <laughs> for three hours down in Florida not too long ago. And I said, uh, is it true or false that we all 
act like adolescents in the home with our spouses. And they all said, absolutely. You know? And then I said, what do you guys do? And they were very transparent. So here you have these great individuals, some of whom won Super Bowls, saying they act like teenagers. And what we have to do is recognize we are all this way mm -hmm. and quit having this shame. And then what happens, and it gets worse, and it gets worse, we just, and we start being defeated by our defeats. And what we have to do is one of us has to come to a point where we say, you know what, I'm not going to keep on the crazy cycle. And even though in the initial period where I'm doing some things to try to make changes and they're not responding, I'm going to stay with this because I have a hunch they're going to soften if mm. I do the right thing here. Mm. So, and I love this because you've done such a great job describing this, the, the, the crazy cycle and really what so many couples get tripped up on. How do you get off of this? I mean, for those who have been spinning for some time, I'm just, I'm just wondering if they're thinking, well, gosh, I sure hope my spouse is listening right now because they're the issue, right? What do you say to couples who are kind of in that impasse where they're, they're spinning, but they don't really know how to take the next step? Well, I think first of all, as Sarah always says at our conference, you'll never get off the crazy cycle. It's a matter of getting off of it sooner, though. In other words, Sarah and I still get on the crazy cycle every day. At one way or another, there is this misunderstanding. We start to spin a little bit. Um, and so we have learned, though, to recognize it and jump off of it quicker. And I say that because you, you, sailors prepare for the storm prior to the storm. And then when the storm comes, they don't, they, they don't freak out. I mean, how many guys would jump ship? Oh, 300 guys went over the, uh, the rail today into the ocean and drowned. Why? Well, there's a storm. There was a storm in the open sea. Well, didn't they know as sailors there would be storms? No, I guess they didn't sign up for storms, you know. Well, there are going to be storms in marriage. And some of us freak out and we, we, we jump ship. We bail, yeah. you know, because yeah. we think, hey, it should be Hollywood. It should be romantic 99 percent, though none of those people in the silver screen have that kind of relationship in real life in Malibu. Come on. <laughs> and, but yet we, we buy into that image. And so what we do is we have this expectation. I call it the 80-20 rule rather than the 99-1. 80% can be wonderful, but there's going to be 20% a problem. And that 20%, you got to roll with it like you do with the storm in the open sea. Because if you don't, a little leaven leavens the whole. Then it starts affecting the whole 80%. So the first thing people have to recognize is that, hey, we're going to get on the crazy cycle. But that in and of itself, when we recognize that's normal, it's not abnormal, that we're okay, then our spirits soften. If a couple, though, thinks, well, we should have a perfect romantic relationship 99% of the time, you, you've got unrealistic expectations. And the difference between that, you know, 99 and 80 is 19%. Mm -hmm. And that's going to disillusion you and it's going to embitter you mm. because you're going to have an unrealistic idea of what it should all be about. Yeah. We have found tremendous healing coming to people, Noel, once we say to them, relax, roll with this. Mm -hmm. You're going to spin a couple times. What you don't want to do is spin five, six, seven times over the next three hours in the evening. Yeah. Spin a couple times, but then one of you needs to make a move. Now, we always get asked the question, well, who moves first to get off the crazy side? Right. The one who sees himself or herself as the most mature moves first. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and it has to be this person because you see your spouse is childish. Right. As a man, it's childish for her to react to all these things that are not important and not to drop it. And it's childish for him to walk away. So we all believe the other person is childish, okay? So then you, the mature one, need to take the first step to bring about the change. And the reason that's important, because if that's not a viable option to you, then you're holding your spouse totally responsible. But when you do that, you're giving them all the power. You're basically saying they've got to change in order for you to be happy. And I, for one, don't want Sarah to be the control factor for me being happy. And I also don't want to believe that she's going to be absolutely unresponsive to me if I do something that's loving or say that I was sorry for being unloving. I have found that I have tremendous influence if I operate according to these principles and concepts. I have influence, I have power, and I also bring about happiness in the relationship. I like that seat. Now, if I take the position that Sarah's responsible for my responses and Sarah's responsible for her responses and that my happiness is based on Sarah's performance, then my whole mission is to get to is to change her. I live to change her. Many wives will tell me they are guilty of that, that they're living their life to change their husband so that he'll initiate more lovingly so that she can respond in a way that will meet his need. 
And because he's not initiating rightly, she must now campaign to change him, rather than believing that it's not about trying to change him into a more loving man, but how to confront him respectfully about being an unloving man. Yeah. And when you understand it's about you being a respectful woman, regardless of him, and seeing this as a marathon, not just, I'm going to try that tonight and see if this theory works, but that over the next several months, as I say, every month you've been married, stay with it. So if you've been married 18 years, 18 months. Six years, six months. Three years, three months. Stick with it and watch what happens. I mean, you've got to be married to one bad dude or one bad dudess for this not to work. <laughs> We've just found it. Yeah. It just works. Yeah. And it's so, simple. So they've taken that step that you recommend. And I love that you say, wh whichever one's the more mature one, because that's a great way to phrase it. You, take us through the energizing cycle. Cause I think that's the hope in this is that once you get off the crazy cycle, there's another side of this that's actually life giving to the relationship. That's right. I mean, we can't s spend our whole life trying to stop the negative, you know, I mean, okay, let, how can we, s we live to stop this crazy cycle. And that's a huge thing decoding, giving the other person the benefit of the doubt, asking, did I just come across unlovingly or disrespectfully? Um, you know, you're stepping on my air hose, all the things we've kind of referenced. And there are a whole lot of other things we talk about in the book on that. But the energizing cycle says his love motivates her respect and her respect motivates his love. And we have found that the key, Noel, to motivating another person is meeting that person's deepest need, especially during conflict. Yeah. As that's why I'm saying you're going to know if this person is ill-willed. If you do this for the next three months, meeting their need for love, meeting their need for respect, even though they don't deserve it, even though it's difficult, just try it out. Excuse me. Just try it out and see what happens over that period of time. There are very few men are not going to respond to issues of respect and honor. Why? Because we live by an honor code. And if he's been unloving, and he knows he was unloving, and you say, did I come across in a disrespectful way that triggered this unloving reaction? I need to seek your forgiveness for that. That is not fair to her to do that. But we're not talking about fairness. We're talking about effectiveness. And I predict that if she does that consistently, it's unfair to her, Unfair, 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 unfair. But she's empowering herself, empowering himself. And what happens, because men live by the honor code, there comes this light bulb moment. She's a better man than I am, he says to himself. And because we, and this is where I say to women, you have to trust us. Men live by an honor code. Suddenly, you're treating him justly, you're giving him mercy, and you're honoring him when he doesn't deserve it. He has to soften and move towards you and seek forgiveness for what he did wrong. It's within us to do that. Just as every woman needs to know this, it's axiomatic, all the research has pointed this out, that if a man humbles himself and says, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? It is absolutely predictable that every woman who is caring about the relationship will say, oh, no, no, it wasn't you two. I was bad. Will you forgive me? I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Yes. It is axiomatic for her to reciprocate. It's within her nature as a loving woman. What we've removed is this understanding of the honor code and how you trigger the honor code by doing what I just said. And the analogy or the moral equivalency is to say to women, just as if he said, I was unloving, will you forgive me? I'm sorry. Everything in you softens and moves toward him to say the same thing. Trust me when I say that over here. Now, why should you do that? Because you're meeting his need for respect, even though he doesn't deserve it. And it motivates him. It influences him. It mm -hmm. persuades him. It affects him. And so, too, when a man says, I'm, you don't have to be perfect as this lover. You just need to say, I'm sorry for being unloving. Women respond to the statement, I'm sorry for being unloving. They are all over that. They mm -hmm. don't expect you to be perfect. I mean, many women complain. It's not that I want my husband perfect. I just want him to say he's sorry for those moments where he was imperfect. But he never apologizes to me. Partly because you use it later on as ammunition. So you've got to be fair here and not use it. And you'll motivate him to make more confessions more often. But nonetheless, when a man does that, uh, you, you don't have to be perfect at this loving thing, but this just energizes her. It just influences her. So those would be some initial things on the heels of the crazy cycle, how you can begin to be more proactive and all you have to do is say, I'm sorry for being disrespectful. I'm sorry for being unloving. And that energizes them. Mm. But you probably will want you know, to ask the next question, well, what are some very proactive things yeah. you know, that we could do on the, 
interject. And, and, and you talk about uh, an acronym of chairs. I'm, I find that really fascinating in terms of how this plays out, the dynamic of it. Can you just touch briefly on what that is? Right. And we spelled out how you spell love to a woman with the acronym COUPLE, C-O-U-P-L-E. Okay. And, and women say, I have no idea what you're talking about when you're talking about respect. And I always say to them, do you know what disrespect is? Oh, yeah, I got that <laughs> yeah. down. I said, and then I just say, well, soften the disrespect and he'll feel honored because he knows. He, yeah. he can tell. He can just see it. Right. You are less negative. See, and one of the things we point out, women want the relationship more positive. Surprise me. Romance me. Make me laugh. Women want more positiveness. Yeah. Men, they just want it less negative. Right. Can't we just have one day when everything's okay? Yeah. Yep. So uh, just softening the disrespect motivates them. But we spell respect to the man chairs, C-H-A-I-R-S, as you just referenced. And we go through these six concepts and, and we say, here's how a man is motivated. This is what motivates a man. And when you step on his air hose in each of these areas, he's going to deflate and withdraw. But when you meet that need in this area, he's energized, just as in the area of couple when you deprive her of that, she's going to react to you. But when you meet that need, she'll soften. Yeah, that's so good. I'm just thinking about the one, the, the scenario, and I'm sure you see this a lot, where one of the spouses is operating inside this love and respect cycle, yet the other one refuses to join. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned it as a reward, the rewarded cycle. What would you say to that individual who really has the you know, they're pursuing this and saying, I'm going to do everything I can in my own will to make sure that, that operates, but I'm not seeing that responsiveness of my spouse. Is Right. What would you say to them? Well, I think first of all, you know, I, I, when I was one, my mom and dad divorced each other. When I was like two and a half, I saw my dad attempt to strangle my mother. Um, they separated, they remarried each other, but then they separated for many years. So I come out of a situation where there's adultery. He, my dad committed adultery when I was 11. Uh, there was the enraged and the moments of violence. Uh, there are individuals out there who are unfaithful and who betray. <clears throat> but even my dad uh, changed uh, mm. for the better. And uh, wonderful things happened. And mom and dad came together years later. And, and uh, we were not a Christian family. We're not a Christ-following family. But my mom and dad uh, found Christ later in life, and it just changed them. They changed. Wow. Uh, they're now deceased. But the, um, um, uh, the point I want to make is that one person can, in fact, be initiating Noel, but the other's uh, shacking up with a secretary, or she's having an affair with a neighbor. And so they will make you the enemy. I mean, you do these things, and they come under conviction, but they, they hold you up as the worst person in the planet. That's mm -hmm. because they're feeling guilty, and you off set guilt with blame and anger. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you're extremely effective, but it's on the heels of their unfaithfulness and they're not wanting to open their spirit to you. But what I say in that situation, you just stay the course. This is who you're going to be, whether or not that's the way they are. You know, back in the 1800s, a young African-American boy, 14 years of age, was being sold on a block of wood to some slave owners. And before the auction began, the slave, one slave owner came up to the boy and whispered in his ear and saying, if I buy you, will you be honest? And the young boy looked at the man and said, whether you buy me or not, I'll be honest. Mm. The point is this, that's who I am. Mm. I'm going to be an honest person whether they, you know, re regardless of them. Yeah. I'm going to be a loving husband toward this woman regardless of her behavior. This is who I am. This is not about who she's failing to be. Why would I become a hostile, hateful person because of her failings? I'm going to be a woman of dignity, of respect. This is who I am, regardless of my husband. I'm not going to become this contemptuous, bitter soul because of his failings. So that's a decision that we all must make up front. But now, that's looking at the worst case scenario. It may not work because of their unfaithfulness. So we're not pretending, because of my own life story here, that these things immediately work, you know, because of the evil that can be there. But a person says, but I, I've been doing this for a couple weeks and it doesn't seem that they're responding. Well, I always ask, what's the history here? Well, the guy says, I committed adultery several times over the years, but I've really got my life. Well, now, okay, so now we're talking about a trust issue here. Yeah. She's afraid. Right. It's not that she doesn't want to respond to this. She's afraid that if she does and reopens her heart to you, that you're going to fail her again. So you got to give this more time. Yeah. So if something really horrible happened prior to this, which people don't often tell you, I tried this for three weeks and it's not working. <laughs> well, what did you do for three years prior to this? Right. 
So you got to stay with this for a little bit and let's just be mature adults. There are prices that we must pay over past consequences and you've got to reassure this person that this is authentic. And if there's any degree of authenticity, here's the deal though, if nothing really horrible has happened prior to this and there's nothing that's really horribly happening out there, then it's, it's, it's too soon to quit. Yeah. And it may be again that you're not applying what we're saying. You think you are. You're saying, I, I just love you, honey, she says. No, 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 no. He knows you love him. That's why during conflicts, you know, but I love you. He's, I know you love me. You know, so many women say, I say to him, I love him, but he's, I know I love him, but he doesn't receive it. That's because that's not his need. His need is, do you respect who he is in spite of what he just did? And do you see him as an adequate man who's brave enough to die for you, even though he failed you on this particular point and you don't have feelings of respect toward that? See, part of the problem is we think, as a woman, I'm respecting him by telling him that I love him. And so they think they're actually applying these things when they're really not. And so I always caution people, don't be presumptuous. That's why the book has been written. Follow what I'm saying. I say to the men, don't you just do what you think is the loving thing. Well, it's a loving thing. I don't want to escalate this conflict beyond what it should be. I'm a loving man, so I'm walking out of here because that's the most loving thing to do. No, it's not the most loving thing to do. It's the most honorable thing to do in our, in our world as men, but it is not the most loving thing because this woman is not unhitching a grenade and going to throw it at you. This is not a life and death situation. She's actually got a need for you and needs to connect with you. And so you need to see here that you're not doing the wise thing, even though your heart's in the right place. And so I coach him, you think you're doing the, the, the good thing here, but you're, you're at cost purposes. Yeah. That's why I say the man has to do the loving thing, not the respectful thing. The wife has to do the respectful thing, not the loving thing. It doesn't mean you can be unloving or disrespectful, but I think you, you see the point I'm making here. Absolutely. And when you do, it works. And that's why, though, we wrote the book, and they need to read the book because it'll help them with specific questions that they're asking. But you know what's amazing about this is that as I've gone through this with my wife and now we have three little boys, nine, seven, and five, much of what you describe is showing up at this very young age. And I just wonder, and I know that I don't want to spill the beans here, but you know, kind of getting ahead of the cycle here and getting um, down, or going upstream to really deal with this, uh, I, I see a lot of this playing out at that young, young uh, age that they're you know, experiencing right now, many of the concepts that you're talking about. Tell us a little bit about something that's pretty, pretty uh, special that's coming out here fairly soon. Well, the backstory in this, Sarah, my wife, put me onto this early on. She, she, she would say to me, ask the women at our conferences, how many of you have sons? Because uh, what happens is that there are um, mothers out there of sons who suddenly realize, whoa, they don't want their sweet daughter-in-law to treat their precious baby boy the way they're treating their husband. And the light bulb comes on, not because the women want to apply this toward their husbands, but they don't want that <laughs> daughter-in-law to misapply this to their precious baby boys. And the light bulb comes on with mothers toward boys. Interesting. And then what happened, these mothers were going home and applying this and were so blown away by the word choice. They began to say, not just that I love you, but you know what I really respect about you? And they saw the son's head jerk like this. Or, you know, I'm proud of you. Or thank you for being a man of honor who, who told the truth here rather than I just love you for telling the truth, you're an honorable man for telling the truth. Little shifts, and the women began to write me, Noel, and they began to tell me the effects of this. The first thing women do after they think about their marriage is they think of their boys, the mothers who have Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And so we've been working on this, and this is coming so out good. April 5th in 2016, Mothers and Sons called The Respect Effect. And it's stories after story of mothers who apply this to their precious baby boys. We have wow. removed this from the marital radar screen. I think in the West, you know, in the 1800s, a 14-year-old boy goes out and shoots the bear and saves the mother and his two sisters while dad is out hunting somewhere. I mean, he was celebrated as the hero. Right. Our 14-year-old boys don't have those moments as they used to. And I, over a period of time, I think the things that we used to say to young boys that honored them, we're not saying to them because the opportunities in some ways are not there. And yet we can still find them as they relate to character qualities and other things. And we unpack how do you do this in the 21st century? Hmm. And I think it's so true. I mean, I see a lot of uh, the marriage issues today is that you have men that are still boys and they've never transitioned into being a man. And what does that mean? And how do you carry yourself differently in that transition, really? So, so excited about this book that's coming out. Uh, 
we're almost out of time here, but we had a couple questions from our listeners that I wanted to read and see if you could answer for them. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, uh, what is a woman supposed to do if she sees her husband doing something wrong, such as being arrogant or insensitive? Uh, question is kind of how, how does iron sharpen iron without words? Well, I think first of all, for the reasons we've said, you know, arrogant or um, insensitive, right? I mean, again, is that being filtered through a biblical uh, moral code or is it being filtered through a romantic, you know, uh, code? Women are going to be far more sensitive than men. So right from the get-go, that sensitivity in her personally because of her nurturing nature. So the discrepancy will always be there between the wife and husband. And so it's easy to pass judgment on him because he's not a sensitive. I mean, I'm a pastor who talks about communication and all this stuff. Sarah is a hundred times more sensitive to people than I am, mm -hmm. but she doesn't draw her gun and start blasting me away because I'm not as sensitive. She just sees herself honoring me by coming alongside and helping me in that area rather than judging me in that area. Arrogance, every woman who watches a man withdraw and not talk says he's a control freak and he's arrogant and he's narcissistic. Not necessarily. Again, he's trying to do the honorable thing. So I always am cautious in labeling this other person. We're labeling people like we've never labeled people before. And once you start doing that, you'll lose their heart. I mean, should we just say bad things about you? Well, this is who you are. It, it, it's such a hopeless thing. So what we have to do is look at behavior and ask the question, okay, how do I confront these things? You know, you have to first of all say, and, and, and this is what happens, people state things to me conceptually, but they don't give me illustrations. Mm -hmm. Give me illustrations. Give me three examples, because otherwise, when you say arrogant and insensitive, I hear here's a narcissistic person who doesn't care about people and who would run over his own mother if his agenda justified it. But what you do is you, you find out, well, we had a conflict last night. He refused to talk to me and I was hurting and he just ignored me while he read the newspaper. OK, that's a whole different scenario. Yeah, right. But she's now said he's arrogant and insensitive, and how do I confront him? Yeah. Because he's got a problem. Well, maybe not. Maybe you're the one. I always say to women, did you say or do something prior to that that felt hugely disrespectful to him? And no, women have a photographic memory. Women are not mean-spirited. Women are honest. And here's what they say. Yeah, I did. But he should know I didn't mean it. <laughs> this has been said countless times. Yes, I did but he should know I didn't mean it. Well, now you put yourself in the crazy cycle. And it's not so much that he's the arrogant and sensitive one. Maybe you were the disrespectful one. Now, having said all of that, let's just suppose he's got a problem in his life. You've got to address the issue. You don't attack the person. Notice she's labeled his character qualities as bad. He's arrogant and he's insensitive. She's going right toward the heart. Well, you're going to put in, what person is not going to get on the defensive there? How, how does a person deal with that? How, you say, I'm not arrogant, I'm not insensitive. The only thing that you can do at that point is make confession that what you just said is true. Hmm. And if he does, then yeah, okay, now you've got a whole different thing. But I would never start with that. I would talk about the fact, hey, when you shut down and read the newspaper, I feel blocked out of your life. And I feel like I'm just vulnerable when you do that. I, I just wilt inside. I need your strength at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I, apparently I'm coming across to you in a way that's shutting you down and, you, and you're not responding. Or, so it, there are so many things that you can do to appeal to the person. Or if you say in a social setting, he didn't talk to my sister. He sat there and watched the football game. Okay, all right. But that doesn't necessarily mean he's an insensitive person. <laughs> it doesn't mean that he's arrogant. You just need to say, do you realize how much my sister respects you? She thinks you're the cat's meow. And I noticed when you were watching the football game, she came and sat next to you, but you didn't acknowledge her. I just want you to know she was ready to salute you. She just thinks she was wanting to connect with you. Hey, just a FYI, next time, you know, be aware. She just wants to engage you. And I know it was right during the, the, the touchdown time, but you need to see this gal just admires you so much. And I think she was a little hurt by that because you're the man. Yeah. See, we can say things totally different and achieve the same objective. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, next question is from Shelly from Boise, Idaho. She's, she asks, assuming a wife wants to respect her husband, how can she encourage her husband to lead their family in major decisions in a mature and honorable way? Yes. Um, I always say that I have to make the decision in order for Sarah to make the decision. 
<laughs> That's good. That is really well, good. <laughs> well, and it's, uh, some guys are very decisive, but they make a decision. It's, it's like one woman, we were in this public setting, there were about 100 people there, and she says, I want my husband to be the spiritual leader. I really do. And, and let me just insert, the number one complaint from women isn't that my husband dominates me. The number one complaint is I want my husband to be the spiritual leader, just as this question. Women long for that. And so it's really a tender thing, and women want that. But this woman is saying, I want my husband to be the spiritual leader, but I just want him to make decisions in keeping with what I want. <laughs> and everybody did what you did. They just broke out in laughter. <laughs> and for the first time, she saw that. And this is what I say to women. You're not mean-spirited, and you really know what you fear, and you know what you think is best, and you think that he doesn't take into consideration all the things that you would. And I, I get that. But you're not going to let this man... And improve as a leader if you don't allow him to make decisions that you don't always agree with. There are certain moments where you have to ask yourself, is this a situation where I need to give him the freedom to make that decision so that he builds the confidence that it's okay for him to be that spiritual leader? The reason men in many cases are not the spiritual leader is that they fear judgment. Hmm. Pure and simple. Yep. And they're just not going to go there because it, it, it feels very dishonoring to them. And so this is a issue that I'm addressing on spiritual leadership, we won't go into it, but my belief is that if she says to him, hey, I want to follow your leadership on this next decision, what do you think we should do? And honor him in that. Now, if he's not putting the kids at risk, if it's not something that's going to take you in major debt, you know, start out with, even if you need to, with smaller things that you feel comfortable with, but go with the decision. And understand there is something within the woman, it's, it's, it's interesting and it's intriguing that uh, if, if you say A as the man, she, she comes to him and says, I don't know between A and B. Well, he says, I think you should do A. There is something within the heart of the woman that almost 60% of the time she'll go with B. She starts going back the other direction. I don't know what that proclivity is in the, in, in the, in the woman, but it's kind of defeating to the man. It's kind of like the, the wife bought this husband a red tie and a blue tie for his birthday. Monday morning, he came down with a blue tie on. She said, you don't like the red one, do you? <laughs> and so guys get to a point where they think, you know what? It's kind of pointless what's, for me. What's, yeah, exactly. And, and I'm not dismissing the male. There are men who are involved in pornography. They're involved in secret things, and they're not going to lead. I, I get that. So I'm not being lighthearted about this. But if this man overall is a guy that's seeking Christ, he's a good-willed man, he's got leadership ability— but maybe you've got more leadership gifts. You've got to get the leadership, a gift of administration. Maybe he's more of a gift of mercy. Uh, I, I get that. But you need to backpedal here. You're trying to be helpful. I know your motivation. You're wanting him to have information that will help him. But I think there's a period of time where you just get behind his decision. Just get behind it hmm. and watch what begins to happen. That's really, See, who, really who discovered the parachute? It wasn't a woman. It was some kid that continued to jump out of a tree with a blanket. With he, he was, men are risk takers, and, and, and in economics they know that women are more risk averse. They they don't want as much risk. Men are more risky. So now you have right from the get go, if he makes a decision that she considers a bit more risky, she's going to call that into question. Yeah. And what happens at a certain point, and guys will say that you're going to wear the pants. You just make the decision, and he disengages, and this just kills her. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't see what she did that contributed to this. I don't hold her totally responsible, but I'm trying to empower her that she can do something different here. But she's got to be willing to allow him to take some risks here, and she's got to go along with that as long as the kids are not in harm's way yeah. and she he doesn't take you into debt. We're not talking about, I'm going to start a business, going to mortgage the house. No, no, we're not talking about major items. These little things here. Let him make some decisions over here and right. get behind it right. and watch the spirit. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, Joel from Austin, Texas, he wrote in and said, my wife is always asking me to share my feelings. How can I do a better job of that while still being myself? I'm not a person who talks about the way I feel. A oh, huge issue. Joel has captured what many men do. Uh, Dr. Doherty, uh, the world renowned professor at university of Minnesota, they have a department that, is, it, that prepares marriage and family therapists to do research. So it's a PhD program. This is the Harvard of of PhD studies on marriage and family, he was head of that program. And he says, I was 14 years old when I remember my first feeling. <laughs> what? Yeah, he was an wow. academic. He was a geek. He's a scientist. He's a mathematician. Yeah. Okay. 
He's a survey researcher. And he pointed out that a lot of men are that we're, we're not emotive. It, it's not a matter of us being uncaring. It's not a matter of us not even having feelings. We have a lot of feelings with regard to respect and honor. We don't necessarily have a lot of feelings in the area that women do about love. That's why women cry through sleepless in Seattle and we sleep through sleepless in Seattle. But when we go to the gladiator or saving private Ryan, we're weeping yeah. because men are emotional about issues of honor. So one thing I'd say to his wife, or you could say to Joel could say to his wife, if we talk about issues of honor and respect, I'm going to probably get pretty emotional. Mm. But if you're saying to me, why don't I express to you all my fond feelings of affection for you? And maybe I should, and I should be more expressive. I think I could write it a little bit more and maybe some notes, but Overall, because I don't express my feelings doesn't mean that I have negative feelings. I just don't operate that way. But this is a real issue of conflict because, again, what we've seen in the overall culture is those who subscribe to an evolutionary worldview that we're here by randomness and that we've evolved from apes and that we're all evolving, they truly believe it. The intellectuals, good-willed intellectuals who are secular atheists believe we've evolved. Mm -hmm. And that women now have evolved farther down the evolutionary line. They truly believe that. And, they, and they're sincere. And they're, they're smarter people than I am and better people than I am. I'm not impugning. But once you lock into that philosophical worldview, men are still back here in Neanderthal, then the whole campaign is to change men through litigation, through medication of boys, through social ostracism, uh, blasting. And so you have this ongoing uh, statement that men ought to be like women that men ought to have the feelings of women. At the same time, men need to be strong enough to defend a woman when somebody opens up fire in a theater and starts shooting people. You know, we just saw it in Aurora several years ago. Three girls walked out of that theater because the boys threw themselves, their boyfriends threw themselves on their bodies mm -hmm. and died. Yeah. And there were female uh, media people that were stunned at this. There wasn't one man in America that was stunned by this. Mm -hmm. And we just saw it in... San Bernardino, right. where yep. the guy grabs his peer worker and says, I got you, and he died. Yep. And she said, he will always be my hero. Yep. Okay, so we want that male strength. We, women want that male strength, but they also want that feminine side. And, and it, it, it doesn't work that way any more than we say to the, men, the women, stop being fearful and yep. stop being so emotional. I need you to be less feeling-oriented. I just, just got emotional as you were sharing about the San Bernardino thing. You know, I mean, point, point taken. <laughs> yeah. It, well, my point is that we've got to, Joel is asking on behalf of himself and how he can best represent himself to his wife. And I get that. I think um, I don't necessarily want to get into the details on how he can broach that subject. But I say to the women on the other side of this thing, be a little bit more empathetic toward your husband. He's not wrong because he doesn't talk about his feelings in the way that you want him to. Right. And I understand it's a problem because women say my husband's a mysterious island. I'm forever paddling around him, but he doesn't permit me to land. And so you see this stoic guy and you're wanting to draw him out. Don't ask him about what he's feeling. Ask him about what he's thinking. Hmm. Just make a little yeah. switch there. That's what good. are you thinking today? Right. Watch what happens. So good. Well, Emerson, I just want to say thank you so much for this time and being able to uh, interview you. What we've been talking about is love and respect and your soon to be released book, Mothers and Sons, which we have a date on that, right? That's coming out April 5th, April 5th. So and we'll, we're going to be doing a simulcast in May. Okay, May good. 4th. So can people pre-order? Yes. Okay, good. So yes, we'll have all that information right underneath this video of how you can get either one of these books. And, uh, but more importantly, I just want to say, Hey, wish you and your family a Merry Christmas. I love your tree behind you. I, that, that is impressive. Uh, but thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I have nothing to do with that. That is the art <laughs> and artistic ability of my wife. <laughs> I, I, I know exactly what you mean by that. So, well, hey, have a great one. And again, thank you so much. God bless you, Noah. All right. Take care.